Uh, take your Bible, turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 13, if you would. While I, uh, let's see here, why am I not connected to my projector? Here we go, got to push the right buttons. There we are, Genesis chapter 13. Uh, we're going to finish up there and then we're going to move into Genesis 14. I was asking uh, John earlier uh, in Genesis 14, it'll be a while before we get there, but I was asking him about who Melchizedek was in his honest and humble opinion. And I want you to ponder that. <clears throat> like I said, we're not going to be there for a little while, but I want you to ponder who, in, in your opinion... Who is Melchizedek? Okay. And I'm not going to say anything uh, until we actually get there. I want you to study it. And I want you to uh, to think about it. There's a couple of possibilities, probably about three. And um, one of them I think is really invalid. But I won't say which one that is. But uh, of the other two, I think either one of them is is probably valid. I have my opinion. Other people have theirs. So anyway, we'll study that. But I wanted to say this in Genesis uh, chapter 13. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask God to bless. Uh, continue to pray for Sister Linda Toomey. Uh, she's really, really battling some health issues. And um, she's very, very sick right now. And they think... They think she may have contracted COVID. And, of course, she's been homebound for most of this time and uh, wasn't tested. Uh, you know, some people vary in their symptoms. We think Lisa had it while I had it, but she didn't really exhibit any symptoms. Uh, if she had any major ones, she hid them from me. But she did say for a while she lost taste and smell. And uh, so anyway, that, that may have been the limit of hers. But it affects people uh, different ways. And sometimes those effects, we're finding out those effects linger. And they don't, some of them haven't gone away yet. So just pray for anybody that's had that and pray that other people don't, just don't get it. Amen. They, they don't, you don't need it. I've had it. You don't need, you don't need COVID. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, Genesis chapter 13, let's, um, let's start verse 11 and we'll read our way down and then we'll pray. Bible says, then Lot chose them all the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Now at this time... Sodom is a beautiful grassland, like the Garden of Eden. It is well watered, which means plenty of water for the cattle to drink. Cattle was your wealth back then. Plenty of water for the cattle to drink. Plenty of uh, grass for the cattle to eat. Plenty of water and land to grow crops on. So man could really be very wealthy. And then he chose to dwell toward the cities. The cities are the markets. You want to sell cattle and grain, that's where you sell them. Now, if you just want to keep all that, you can keep it and you live high on the hog. But you can sort of see Lot's thinking here. He's choosing the marketplace of Sodom, uh, probably because of the money. And it cost him everything that he had with the exception of his two daughters. The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. They did it worse than anybody else. Yes, it is true that all will die of sin no matter what that sin is. Some people in this life struggle against sin they don't like it they don't like even if they're not saved they don't like it there are former alcoholics who won't drink ever again because they don't like what it does to them and their family and everything else but they're not saved they strive against it 
They're former drug addicts. Uh, and any other kind of addiction. There are people who just don't want that in their life anymore, so they, they put it away, and they, they struggle against it every day, but they're not saved. Then there are some people who love sin, have no conscience whatsoever when it comes to performing that sin. They do not care who it harms, what harm it does to everybody else. They care nothing about it. They only want more sin and more sin. These, that's the kind of people he's talking about. They were sinners before the Lord exceedingly. They pushed the barriers of sin. And they had it, they were living in a town where if you got enough people that are sinners, there's always going to be plenty of sin. You can guarantee that. So verse 14, the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. Now God made a promise. He intends on keeping it. Don't you ever take the land of Israel away from Israel. God can do it. Man can't. And he said, I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then he shall, then he shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Let's go to prayer. Father, we ask your blessings now upon this message, upon this teaching. Father, I just, I'm going to talk about heaven tonight. I'm going to talk about how wonderful heaven is. Father, help us to start hating this world more and more and more until we just are not going to be happy until you've taken us out of here and taken us to a far better place. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for, for the promise of heaven, for giving us the faith of Father Abraham we thank you, God, for having the grace on us that you've given us. We ask your blessings on your word. Open our eyes and fill our hearts with hope. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. I've, made it, I've always made it a point to mention that if you remember what Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And I'll never forget, I, I'm looking at this and I'm looking at Abram. And he showed biblical meekness. He deferred to Lot, even though he didn't have to, wasn't required of him. He deferred his rights, yielded them over to Lot. Lot, you choose whatever you want. Lot chose the watered plains. He's probably got that good, thick, green grassland, that bottom ground. He's got, he's got the marketplace of Sodom to, to make money with. He's thinking his cattle are going to increase. He's going to take them to the markets. He's going to grow some grain. He's going to take that to the markets. He's going to become a wealthy man. And then Abram let Lot choose that. So now Abram has suffered loss. He suffered the loss of probably the choicest ground that was there. So he's probably left with that wilderness that's full of thistles, thorns, Rocks. Rondagonia showed me one time. He's, he bought a field out there and plowed out most of the trees. He left some for deer ground and stuff like that. But we were standing outside his truck one time talking and he walked around, picked up a rock and threw it in the back of his truck. Well, that ground down there, there's a reason why they raise cattle and not corn and wheat. It's full of rocks. Ron said, you know, I found out the best way to get all these rocks off this property. And I said, how? He said, one at a time. And he had 500 acres worth of it. And uh, so anyway, that's probably the ground that Abram got left with. But then God took him aside. And I've always made a point about this. You count things. Look at what he said. Lift up, verse 14, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward. What direction is God coming from in Ezekiel 1? North. And he said southward. 
and eastward and westward. One, two, three, four. So he's promising him not just the gospel. He's promising him a land that's associated with this number. The number four. And let's go to Genesis, or excuse me, Revelation. Turn to uh, Revelation 21. I don't have this on the screen, so I just want you to open your Bible up. It's been a long time since I've preached about heaven. You don't hear a lot of sermons on it. I, I guess I'd much rather preach on hell to just scare everybody, warn them, and let heaven preach itself. But then just to understand if people tell you, well, we have no idea what heaven's going to be like. Yeah, we do. Even though, you know, Paul said, I have not seen nor ear hath heard, uh, nor have there entered in the heart of man the things that God has prepared him. That he says right after that, but the Spirit hath made them plain to us. In other words, the Spirit shows us we have the mind of God. So even though our imagination has not drawn up a fanciful picture of what heaven is, and even if it does, it might be wrong, we still can know what heaven is like if we believe the Bible. Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Let me just, just as a point of interest, why do you think God has eliminated the sea? Is there going to be water in heaven? Sure, there is. But why has God eliminated the sea? Huh? Well, that, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. I like that. Had thought of it. That's not what I'm thinking of, but... It is associated with death because the sea gives up her dead. And think why. Think why. Okay. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Okay, but here's where I'm going. What's the difference between seawater and lake water? Salt. Salt burns. The, the process, the chemical process of salt on iron is the same as fire on grass. It is an oxidation of material that consumes it. It is the same process. Rust just takes longer than fire does. When you have salt, when you have a wound, rub salt on it. Burns. And God actually equated those two words together. He said of the land, if Israel goes against God, he said, I'll turn your land into a salt and a burning. If you salt grass, what will happen to it? It'll burn it up. So salt water is a picture, a symbol of Hell fire. So when they, when the pigs jumped into the sea, it's the picture of they're being tossed into hell. They're being thrown into hell. Okay? So at this point, I think God eliminates the sea because He's done punishing, burning. There's no fear besides that. You can't drink it. Okay? So he does away with that which burns and that which represents, like you said, the dead. What you said is valid, represents division. God divided the lands with the sea, so on. But I think it, I think it represents burning and judgment and God has done away with that. He's purified the waters, no more salt in it. Yes, sir. Turned into a pillar of bada boom judgment, right? That's good. Man's thinking right. And he said, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Think of cities in the Bible. 
The New Jerusalem is a pure bride. Babylon is a, a whore, a slut. That's who she is. She's lascivious. She's dirty gal. She's strange woman. Now I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. Think about how wonderful that is. This is Emmanuel. God is with them. He will, God himself, the Father, the unseen God, will be with men. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and their God. And God shall wipe away what? What do tears taste like? Boom. Makes sense now, doesn't it? God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. I've planned funerals, I've preached funerals, I've attended funerals, I've buried loved ones, I hate death, I'm not looking forward to the death of anybody that I love and anybody I know. It will kill me. I'm already just, I don't deal well now with things. And to deal with the possibility that one of my children or my grandchildren or my wife or my mom, my sister, my in-laws, the possibility of them dying, any one of you guys, that grieves me already. And we will not have to deal with that ever again. It's going to be passed away. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Whenever you get down in the dumps, read Revelation 21 and 22. And he said unto me, It is done. It is done. Which is similar to what he said at the cross. It is finished. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely, he said. No works, no money. It's not given to the first class passengers. It's not given to the upper class. It's given to everybody. Everybody that's poor in this world. Those people in Turkana. Some of the poorest people that we can minister to in this world. And they may die poor, but they'll gain heaven one of these days. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. I underline that verse as a verse to remember or to show people who believe in this nonsense. Well, I prayed when I was six. I'm my... My preacher told me back then I'd go to heaven. So I'll just do whatever I want to. I'll still go to heaven. That's not what he said. He said, he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. That's what he said. Be fearful. and un But the fearful and unbelieving. Let's count these. Fearful. I, I think there's eight here. Fearful, unbelieving, the abominable, murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. There's eight. Why? Why is there eight? Huh? Right. Because at this time in Revelation 20, he's already taken the dead out of the sea, given them a new body. And judge them and cast them into the lake of fire. This is the eighth day, by the way. This is the eighth day. This is why they were circumcised on the eighth day. It's to show that we put off the works of the flesh and the deeds of the flesh. They didn't. They die in the uncircumcision of their heart. They are regenerated. And on this eighth day, they are judged. And even the number eight... Has no beginning and no ending. Okay? In the occult world, they take that and turn it sideways. They say it's the number for infinity and the number for uh, eternal life or everlasting life. Well, for them, I'm sorry, but it's not really life that's everlasting. 
But that's why there's eight things here, because that's the day we're dealing with. So he said, they shall have their part in the lake of fire, wait, the lake with burnish with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues. And talk with me, saying, come hither and I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and shewed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. Remember what I said this morning about mountains. They represent kingdoms. They represent heaven. Represent God's kingdom or where the gods dwell. So he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. Showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God. Now think about this. In Genesis 11, man wanted to build a city that would reach into heaven. He wanted to build himself a heavenly dwelling place. This last week, we're seeing more and more the billionaires investing in space rockets, space ships. Including, believe it or not, the Pentagon applying for a patent to develop a warp drive machine. A machine... I need a piece of paper. Who's got a piece of paper? A machine that will warp... Let's say that... You're here, this is Earth, and this is, we find another planet that's suitable for life, but we can't get there because it's a hundred light years away. So, the ability to warp space so that you bring them like that. Okay? Isn't that bizarre? But that's what God does. God said He bowed the heavens and came down. Okay? That's what he said. And he also said he opened it as a what? A scroll. I mean, they're going to develop it. I believe. They want the ability to leave this earth to escape God's judgment and wrath. I don't think... God said, go ahead... I'm going to bring you back down. So anyway, where was I? What verse was I on? 11. Having the glory of God in her light was like the stone unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. And it had a wall great and high. Even Jerusalem has a wall. And it's for protection. It is walls are salvation. You want God to build a wall around you. Which means you will be separated from the sinners. And you want it that way. Because when he judges the sinners, you don't want to be around it. But anyway, had a wall great and high and twelve gates. And the gates, twelve angels. And the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And on the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. So you have the names. You look over in Revelation 7. Here's the list of names. Verse 5. Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh. Verse 7. Simeon, Levi, Issachar. And see, here's what's interesting. Levi was not to be given a portion of that earthly inheritance. But they are given a portion of the heavenly inheritance. Why? They're not the priests anymore. Amen. And uh, verse 8. The tribe of Zabulon were sealed 12,000. Joseph, which would be uh, Ephraim in this case. Joseph through Ephraim, because Manasseh is mentioned separate. Uh, of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. So these are the names now that God has written above each 12 of those gates. 
Um, verse 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Remember the number 12, it represents God's promise. So in Genesis 12, God made that promise, that covenant with Abram. He said, I will multiply and bless thy seed. They shall be as the stars of heaven. They shall be as the sand of sea for number. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. So this now represents the fulfillment of God's promise. He made his promise to the 12 tribes. He's given them gates. He made his promise to the Gentiles through the 12 apostles. And he gate caused them to be the foundation stones of Jerusalem. And in the names of the, in, in, in them, the names of the 12 apostles and the lamb. Because he's the 13th stone. He is the chief corner stone. Not the capstone, like the NIV used to say. Used to say, you know, they changed that. In the early renditions of the NIV, they called Jesus the capstone. And sometime in one of the seven different rewritings of the NIV, they took it out. But he's not the capstone on a pyramid. He is the foundation stone at the corner. To make sure that the angles are true. That's the importance of that cornerstone. Is to make sure the angles are true and right. Verse 15. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city. And the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth. That's why. Northward, southward, eastward, westward. The city lieth four square. And I've even had people tell me that they think New Jerusalem is a pyramid. There's, there is no way. A pyramid is not a four square object. It's a three something. I don't know what you would call it. Polygon. But it is not a four square object. It is different. So heaven is not a pyramid. Get that out of your mind. Quit reading Clarence Larkin. Because that's what he said. And he actually had to change the wording of the Bible to get that. And the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. See, it's the number 12. 12,000 furlongs. The length and breadth and height of it are equal. You cannot have an equal pyramid because the length of those four walls are going to be different. They're actually going to be higher to account for the angle that they're on. So it's not possible. Um, and he measured the wall thereof in 144 cubits. That's 12. According to the measure of man, that is of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was jasper. And the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. Can you imagine that? Gold that is so pure, it's glass. Like looking through glass. It has no impurity in it whatsoever. I got I to gotta tell you this one. A guy dies and he goes to heaven. And one of the angels at the gates tells him, Oh, you just died. The guy said, Yeah. And he said, well, did you bring anything with you? And the guy said, well, I always heard you couldn't. The angel said, well, we're trying a new program, seeing how it works. We'll let you go back, take anything you want from the earth, bring it up. The guy said, no kidding. Said, yeah, but you got, you got, you know, four hours to do it. So he goes down, gets into, uh, cause, you know, he's a spirit. He gets into, uh, Fort Knox where all the gold is, fills up these two huge sacks full of gold. Goes back up to heaven. The angel says, oh, I see you, you know, you did it. He said, so show us what you bring. The guy dumps out those gold bars and the angel says, oh, pavement. <laughs> Amen. Uh, verse 18, verse 19, the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was Jasper, the second Sapphire, the third a Chalcedony, the fourth an Emerald, the fifth Sardonyx, the sixth uh, Sardius, the seventh Chrysolite, the
the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. This is similar to the breastplate that Aaron wore. Aaron had a breastplate, had the names of the twelve tribes, each represented by a different precious stone. A beautiful thing to behold. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. That's where we get the idea of pearly gates. They literally are made of pearl. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of this, that must have been one big oyster. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. Man, I saw no, listen to this. I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. We are abiding in Him. And He in us. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Now, on that note, I do believe that the sun and the moon are present because God said that they would abide forever. He doesn't actually say there is no sun or moon. He said there is no need of a sun or moon. And that goes back to Genesis. There was light taking care of the first three days of earth's creation with no sun, moon, or stars. So it wasn't until day four that God created the sun, the moon, and the stars, but he didn't need them on the first three days because he himself was the light of the universe and light of the world. So it's just a thing I have. I, I do believe the sun and the moon are present because God said their ordinances would be forever. But there's just no, they're not used the same way that they're being used now. Uh, the moon's used to be a lesser light during the night. But of course, there is no night there. And there is no sleep there. And there's no need of any of that. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter in anything that defileth. Somebody said, no more masks. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No more hand sanitizer. No more defilement. No more stomach viruses. Ugh. No more cancer, no more sickness, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Turn back to Revelation 20. What happens to the people whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life? Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in. That's verse 15. Cast into the lake of fire. Now, with that in mind, turn to Revelation 60 or uh, Isaiah 60, Revelation 66. Same difference. Isaiah 66. I do believe that we in heaven will see and have knowledge of the lake of fire. Um, he says in verse 22 of Isaiah 66, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I shall make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, I do believe the moon is there, that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, which it leads me to believe that God is still measuring the passage of time, but we will, we will not perceive it as we do here. 
it won't bother us. In other words, you hate waiting for something, right? We hate waiting for something. Hate waiting on somebody. We don't like time. Time's always working against us. I'm out of time. I need to quit. I need more time. I think up there it's perceived differently. But he said, from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. And of course, I got challenged on that one time by a pastor's wife. I, I love her, I do, but she just kind of got huffy during the thing when I said this. And she asked, well, how can this be? And I, I know why, because they had convinced themselves of a different idea. They had, it was actually a couple pastor's wives, and they had fallen into this idea that the new earth was simply this earth that God put a new, like a new coat on, like a new coat of paint. And I know where they got that from. And it, it's just way out there. And they challenged me on this because they said, uh, these people don't have carcasses. They don't have bodies. And I said, yes, they do. The second resurrection gives them a new body that will burn for eternity. This body will burn up after a while. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but Robert Schaefer lost his office, his place of work, because... Um, Something happened with, he's got a crematorium in there and, and something happened and um, the, there was a fire that broke out in the attic and burned everything. But I've been up there enough times to know that the crematorium pretty much does away with everything. It is literally just turned to ashes and there's really nothing else left of the body. If it was that body, it would burn up and that would be the end of the lake of fire. It would not be everlasting torment. I believe the reason why God gives them this new body is that so the punishment will last for eternity. Can you just think about that, people? Think about the everlasting torture of being on fire into the thousands of degrees with absolutely no end to it whatsoever. I don't want that. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for anybody. But I believe that they will be an abhorring to us. I believe that we will look upon them. And I believe that we'll turn and Go bow at Jesus' feet again and tell him thank you again. And thank you again and thank you again and thank you again. That that's not us. So anyway. Um, now, uh, chapter 22, Revelation. He showed me a pure river of water of life. Clear as crystal. Again, no salt in this river. Proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit and yielded. There's that number twelve again, God's promise. In this case, it's the promise. He promises eternal salvation. He's promised us an eternal foundation. Now he's promised eternal nourishment. And, um, you know, I don't know why God gives it to us in the form of fruit. But that's how we started everything in Genesis, was giving us a tree of life. So now we have access to this tree of life for eternity, which bare 12 manner of fruits, yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Again, I don't quite understand why God is doing it this way. What do we need healing from? 
But anyway, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. I am one of those. Glad to be one of those. Humbled to be one of those. And they shall see his fate. This is the first time man has ever gotten to see the face of God. Because God has removed the curse of sin. Because God has given us a new glorified body that cannot die. And it cannot feel any pain. And we are, we will be like Jesus, the Bible says. Then at that time, God will finally grant us access to see his visible face for the first time ever. We get to see the face that no one else can see. Amen. We will see his face and his name. I got to throw this in. Do you know how many bones are in your head? Excluding your teeth. Twenty two. Makes sense, doesn't it? It's revealed. There should be no night there. Verse five. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever. Reign over who? The angels. We are going to, we have been made below the angels. Now we're going to be above the angels. We'll rule over them. Um, Verse 6, he said unto me, These things are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. That's a no-no. Then he said unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. That's how you know you got a good angel. An evil angel would say, bless you, my son, for bowing before me. That's how you know you got the right angel. Amen. The good ones say, get up. We're going to get in. You're both going to get us in trouble. And then he said in verse 10, and he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of this prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. So again, we have the book of Revelation unsealed at the book of Daniel, 27th book of the Old Testament. It is sealed just like in Jeremiah 32 with the sealed and unsealed copy of the book that they wrote down the lamb that Jeremiah purchased from uh, his cousin Hanamiel. So he purchases the land and they write it down in a copy of a book that was open and a copy of the book and they sealed that copy and put them in earthen vessels. We are the earthen vessels so that they would remain for a time to come because that had to do with Israel knowing that they're going to get their land back. God says, I've got the title deed. I've got the record. I promise you the land belongs to you. I run you out of it for a while because of your sins, but I'm going to bring him back and I'm going to give it all back to you. Amen. So revelation is not sealed. Read its words. Try to understand its words. And I'll just say this. The best way to understand revelation is to just believe what it says. Don't try to make it into something unless you follow scripture and you see something in scripture that defines what it is. Stay away from earthly interpretations. Stay away from that. The Bible will tell you what something in the book of Revelation means. In fact, most of the book of Revelation will tell you what the book of Revelation says. And if he said it's a beast with seven heads, believe it's got seven heads. Are they symbolic of something? Yes. They said seven mountains and seven kings and we all understand that. But he meant seven heads and that's, that's what they are. So he said, um, verse 11, he that is unjust, 
Let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. One, two, three, four things. You have unjust, filthy, righteous, and holy. And I think this says that by this time, if you're found righteous, you're staying that way. And it'll never, you'll never change. You'll never, there's never, ever, ever at this point going to come another temptation. Satan's not going to be let out again. We're, we don't have to worry about falling back into the stupid sins that we've fallen back into before. But the warning is to those that are unjust and filthy. That is at this time, there is no amount of the fires of the lake of fire that can purify their filthiness. Not that there isn't enough fire to do that. They are going to remain in that state for eternity. And he said, behold, I, which is contrary to Mormon doctrine, Jehovah's Witness doctrine, and maybe some others that believe that once you die and you're being judged by God, you can get another chance. Well, Rose, don't shake your head because if that's how it is, that's what I'm going to do. I'll walk out of here right now and just go live a life of sin however I want to because after I die, God give me another chance. I'll take it then. I don't see what the big deal is. But that ain't true. Don't fall for that lie. Blessed verse um, 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do His commandments and they that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Now, here, here, let me throw this in. Here's where the Hebrew roots people say, Ah, you've got to keep the commandments. Yes, love the Lord your God. Love thy neighbor. Verse 15, For without are dogs. Now, I'm going to say this again very pleasantly and nicely. I do not believe your dog goes to heaven. Uh, and I'm, I'm being serious. I'm saying this in love. Because I have been, I've been chewed out more than once. From people who have believed that their chihuahua or their labrador or their poodle dog or whatever is wagging its tail at the gate waiting for you to show up. And they say, well, it says dogs. That means like bad people. There is absolutely zero indication anywhere in scripture that animals have redeemable souls. None. The atonement in the Old Testament involved animals, but it wasn't for animals. Christ's blood on the cross was shed for mankind, not any other creature. Now, are there beasts in heaven? Yes, but they are of the angelic order of beasts there are beasts in hell okay and i just i i see absolutely no scripture you you've asked me as your pastor to tell you the truth according to the word of god and I have to do it. I, I don't want anybody to have a false hope. Now, am I wrong about things? All the time. All the time. Is God going to judge you because you believe Fido, P-H-I-D-E-A-U-X, they're French. I do. OK, 
Because if you think that, I believe you're in error. I don't believe God hold it against you. But I would say to you, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. The Bible specifically says that the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of beast goes downward. Specifically says that. I find no justification for the redemption of earthly animals. For without are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, I of Jesus have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and of the bright and morning star. Aren't you glad he's not Lucifer? Amen. And the spirit and the bride say, come and let him that hears say, come and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of life. Really. So we have the water of life. We have the tree of life. We have the light of life. We have the God of life. And in that place, there is no more death. Who likes to go out at night and look at the stars? Who likes that besides me? There's nothing like being out in the country. 50 miles from everybody. And going out midnight, two o'clock in the morning, and it looks like the stars are right there in your face because the city lights don't cover them up. Those of you who live in town, you, you hadn't seen them all yet. But you go out in the country, wait till the middle of the night and just look up there. They're absolutely beautiful. I can't imagine what the heavens are going to look like after they're new. I can't imagine. But I think they'll be even more beautiful. I'll tell you what I think. I think there's colors up in heaven that we, had, we can't see and haven't seen. I think there's sounds that we can't hear that we're going to hear. I think there's music that's not limited to eight notes, Matthew. Okay? Uh, it's just, a, just a, a throw up in the air and catch it and that's kind of what I believe. But I think it's going to be better than down here. Amen. Um, I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. So if you're not in the book of life, Revelation 20, where do you go? You go to the lake of fire. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And from the things which are written in this book, he which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus is our hope. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. This is what he was showing Abraham. Northward, southward, eastward, westward, Abraham. Look around you. Not only this ground here but i'm giving you a country in heaven that will never fade away the enemies will never take it away from your people ever again they'll live in a land where they'll not need bomb shelters and armed guards and everything else they won't need they won't have any crooked politicians up there either all the sicknesses that we watched our loved ones suffer through when they died. Those are going to be gone forever. And I've got loved ones up there that I miss. And I want to see them again. But I want to see them in their new body. I've never told this. Not too long after my dad died. I had a dream. You know, my dad worked on the Mississippi River. Corps of Engineers dredging operation. He worked on a great big boat on the river. And he lost a couple friends of his 
who fell overboard in the river, drowned. And in that dream, we were on that boat and they came and told us that dad had disappeared. And we were afraid that he had fallen off and fell into the river. And, I mean, I was bothered. I was crying. And I remember being on the riverbank and crying for my dad. They were looking for him. And I looked up and I saw him coming to me. But he was young like he used to be. And I just went, God, thank you. That's how I hope to see him again one of these days on the bank of the river, young again. Amen. And it wouldn't bother me if we all were end up like those precious moments kids. <laughs> you got to go see that. If you've never seen it, you got to go to the precious moments chapel and take a look at it. It'll blow your mind. Okay, let's, let's pray. Father, heaven is real. And I don't care what anybody says. I don't care who hates what I said. I don't care who don't believe the Bible. I don't care. I know heaven's real. And I know your grace is what gets us there. It is the place where the poor become wealthy, where the sick become healthy, where the downtrodden become equal, where those who have suffered great loss will attain great gain, where those who died will live forever. There'll be no more salty tears, there'll be no salty oceans, There'll be no burning fevers. There'll just be life and joy and happiness. And it will be new for eternity because there'll be nothing to corrupt anything up there. That's why Jesus died. Because he knew that he was building a place that the people who really wanted to go there can go there. And God, I can't tell you thank you enough. I cannot in eternity praise you enough for giving us a better place to go and a better place to look forward to. The Apostle Paul was right. If all we had in this life was this life, we are of most men miserable having no hope to offer anybody. But we have it. And we thank you for it. Father, help us as we sing every song that we sing about heaven. Help us, dear God, to be telling you thank you for building heaven for us. Sharing with us your home, your house. And for loving us enough to allow us to come and to be in your bosom. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. We thank you Lord. For ending the Bible. With the good stuff. We look forward to that. We ask Father that we all. Make it there. We pray this in Jesus name. And all the God's people said. Amen. God bless you. Let's go to heaven.